Well, we're finishing 2 Peter. I didn't do a very good job of explaining this uh, third of us thing, so I want to do that really quickly. You can join the movement by drawing three lines on some part of your body. You can put it on your forehead if you want. And then take a picture and post it with the hashtag, a third of us, all together. A third of us means... Out of every three people in the world, one claims to be a Christian. That doesn't mean they're all Christians, but they claim to be. One lives next to a Christian, or it's easy for them to find the gospel. It's in their language. They have the internet. And one lives so far from anybody that knows the gospel, or it's not in their language, they don't have a cell phone and internet, that somebody needs to go and tell them. There are 3,000 frontier people groups with no active witness in that people group. And so today is a day for us to remind each other to wake up to the Great Commission, what Jesus has left for us to do, and to be a part in some way of reaching them. So the first thing you can do is draw three lines on your hand and take a picture and post it just to be a part of the movement. I hope that's a blessing for you all. We've been going through 2 Peter under the title Escaping Corruption. I hope you've learned by now what Peter says about that, how he tells us to escape corruption. Corruption is in the world. It's growing. You escape it through your knowledge of him and your belief in his precious promises so that you become a partaker of the divine nature. You have Jesus living inside your body. You become like him more and more and more. So let's just run through quickly what these titles were of reviewing how we, where we've come. We talked about the cause and the cure for corruption. It's our evil desires. The seven supplements for a fruitful faith. I hope you've memorized those by now. I've got one tassel left. If you want to tell me after the service what the seven supplements to your faith are, I'll be happy to share that with you. Confirming our calling and our election, making it sure, it's being established in the truth, being a, dark, a lamp in a dark place, That's what you at Una are doing. Praise God. Uh, Recognizing counterfeits. All of chapter 2 is about false teachers that teach something else. They twist the scripture and not the promises of God. Uh, Wrath or rescue. We can choose to be rescued by the Lord or to continue under his wrath. Brother Aaron uh, did the features of false teachers from chapter 2. Slaves of corruption. Remembering and obeying, being transformed by the renewal of our minds. The earth and the heavens are reserved for fire. Judgment is coming. Jesus will come again. This time, he'll come with power, his glorious angels, and with the fire of judgment. And then a theory of relativity. A day is like a thousand years for God, and a thousand years are like a day. But his patience is for our repentance. Looking forward to the day of God and speeding its coming by taking the gospel to all nations because then the end will come. Last week we talked about living spotless, blameless lives and being at peace with God because we're aware of the judgment. And now we're on the last two verses of 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3, 17 and 18. And the the title I've chosen is Growing in Grace and in the Knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me just read these two verses. And I'm going to give you a warning. You'll turn to your neighbor when I'm done and give a summary of these two verses in your own words. So I'm going to read it, and then you tell your neighbor, without looking at the passage, what you heard in your own words. Here's what it says. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. All right. Tell each other what you heard. Got one minute. Go ahead. You can talk in church. Okay, if they miss something, you can add it. By the way, you parents, or those of you who teach the Bible, this is a great way to start off, thank you, Pedro, uh, getting people thinking, finding out if they're understanding, seeing if they got the whole picture. I ask them to summarize in their own words as you teach the scripture. Let's go through this passage just quickly. 
seeing that making sure we're understanding what it says. We start always with the observation of the scripture. So he says, dear friends again. He's repeated this because he really loves these people that he's writing to. The ESV says, beloved, those of you who are loved by me, and I think he means by the Lord. That's the first step of the gospel, isn't it? God so loved the world. I hope you understand that God loves you. He made you. You can be. You are his beloved. And 1 John 4 uh, declares that we love because he first loved us. If you find yourself lacking love, don't look within yourself. Remember that Jesus loves you. Receive again his love, and then you'll have plenty to share with others. He says, since you have been forewarned. Now he's talking about our context. He's saying, since, since the judgment is coming, since you know that you'll be judged, like Noah and his, the people of his day, like Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, like Nineveh with Jonah. They knew judgment was coming and it changed the way they lived. I hope that's the way you and I live as well. Since you have been forewarned, be on your guard, he says. Stand in a defensive stance. This made me think of basketball. So I was a basketball coach for a while. And you know, if you're playing basketball, those of you who play basketball, if you just hold the ball like this, or any sport, any ball sport, really, if you hold the ball right in front of your belly button, what's going to happen? Somebody's going to hit it, take it away, right? So what do you have to do? You have to protect it. Be on your guard. Guard the ball. That's what Peter's saying. Stand guard against a specific error. What is it that we're supposed to stand guard against? Stand guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless. That carried away is a sense that we are in a, a world that is rushing to its own destruction. The way to destruction is the way of least resistance. It's easy. Just let go and the current of the world will take you right down into the pit of corruption. So Peter's saying, stand guard. Stand firm. Set your feet on the rock of his promises and don't be carried away by the error of the lawless. What is that? So I spent time meditating on what the error of the lawless was this week and as I was meditating, we got the mail. And I opened up a love letter from the Prefeitura and I found out that on my birthday, on the 3rd of February, you know, on my birthday, it was just so wonderful because I got a day away with my beloved. We were leaving church, leaving here. She was at Moments for Moms, and we were going away for the night. And I went down to Santo Amaro, Avenida Santo Amaro, and I must have pulled into the bus lane. I don't remember it. But the Prefeitura remembers everything. And they sent me a picture to prove it. There I was on the bus lane, and there were those seven points on my driver's license for all eternity. No, I think till I renew my license. <laughs> I entered the error of the lawless. Why? What was the error? I didn't think I would have to pay. I didn't think there would be any consequences. I can take this little shortcut around on the... Well, look at all that room over there. It's easy. Just drive over there. And I didn't know that payday was coming. There would be consequences to my disobedience. That's the error of the lawless. They think they're free to do as they please and there will be no answer. They think their mouth can just run on and like the Bible says, they will not give an answer for every single word they say. Every thought, every sin will be judged. If it's under the blood of Jesus, praise God, but I believe we can still, like Peter's saying, be carried away by this error of the lawless, which leads us into lawlessness. You know, there are groups in Brazil, in the church of Brazil, that say that you can do whatever you want. You can divorce your wife and continue in full gospel ministry. You can spend your money on yourself alone. And on and on and on, because God loves you. He wants a wonderful life for you. Do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. That isn't what the Bible teaches. And Peter goes on to say, they fall from your, you will fall from your secure position. 
I like what the ESV says there better. You will lose your stability. It's not losing your salvation. You're not in danger of that if you're truly saved. But you will lose your foothold on the rock of his word if you start believing the error of the lawless, which is do whatever you like. It doesn't matter. Jesus has already forgiven all your sins, so just go out and have fun. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die. That's what Paul says is the idea, the, the philosophy of the world around us, which is an error. So on the way of grace, there are two ditches on each side, one on each side. One is called legalism, the other is called lawlessness. Both are a crash. Both do not help you grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So what does that mean? Lawlessness is what we've been talking about. It's licentiousness. It's, well, aren't I free in grace? Doesn't the Bible say everything is lawful for me? It does. It does. It also says not everything helps you on toward God. There are consequences to your actions. So lawlessness is to be avoided. But the problem is, and if, if you've driven a car and you've gone off the edge of the pavement and you overcorrect, you know that you quickly zip across the road to the other ditch, which is legalism. So we've got to stay in the middle of the road. Legalism is, I would say, the greater pitfall for those that call themselves conservative. Maybe we could say lawlessness is for the liberal, legalism is for the conservative, although we can all fall into any ditch. Legalism would be that idea that laws will somehow advance you in grace or make Jesus love me more because I'm a good boy. Jesus loves you and me as much as he can possibly love a creature that he's created. His love is maximum already. Of course, he wants you to grow in the grace and knowledge of his, of his goodness so that you can be fully what he says you are. So how do we grow in grace? There are at least three ways, and I'm sure you can think up of others, but as I meditated on this idea of how do you grow in grace, three things came to mind. And I heard a, a Shakespeare quote this week. We, we, we were putting on a Shakespeare play at the, at the co-op. The, the, uh, the kids put on Shakespeare. I don't know how Melissa Davis was able to get young kids to do Shakespeare, but she did. Here's something Shakespeare says about grace that I thought was meaningful. Oh, momentary grace of mortal men, which we more hunt for than for the grace of God. The momentary grace of people around us who give us compliments, who make us feel good about ourselves, when really what we should be seeking is growing in the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How do we do that? Uh, two things. It says to grow in. Grow in grace and grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. First, grow in grace. Uh, three ways. A growing awareness of your sin and unworthiness so that the gift of God's forgiveness grows. So when you have the grace of God, you know you're a sinner. Remember Pilgrim's Progress? How many of you have read Pilgrim's Progress? Most read book besides the Bible in the history of people. You should read it. Pilgrim has this burden on his back and it keeps growing every day as he reads the book of life because he knows he's a sinner. But all around him are people with no burden. Does that mean they have no sin? No, they don't have the grace to see their sin. They don't know how offensive they are to God as a selfish, proud, proud egotistical person. So the grace of God convinces me more and more of my sin. Uh, let's watch this happen in Paul's life by reading three passages that are over time. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, Paul says, For I am the least of the apostles. I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. Least of the apostles. That's still pretty good, right? He was the last one to see Jesus. He was the last one to join the group of apostles. He says, I'm the least. Not even worthy to be called an apostle. But then further on in his walk with Christ in Ephesians 3.8, he says, To me, the very least of all saints, the grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. So he's gone down in his estimate of himself. He's the least of the apostles. Now he's the least of all saints. 
But at the end of his life, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he says, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. He's gone all the way down to the bottom of the barrel and sees himself as the worst of sinners because the light has shone on his motivations, on his soul. He knows how proud and selfish and lazy and sinful he really is. That's what it means to grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you think you're doing okay, ask God for his light on your soul and you will be convicted of your need and thus of how big his forgiveness was for someone who is as bad as you. I love to go camping. And I've learned that at the, the first few hours of camping, you get out the, the uh, hand sanitizer over and over to just wash all that dirt off your hands because you're out in the dirt, you're in the woods, you're digging holes, you're pounding stakes, you're cutting firewood, you're lighting fires. Well, at night, you don't see that quite as bad, right? So you're sitting around the fire, you're eating, you're squatting on the dirt and maybe even sitting on the dirt. And after a while, your clothes get kind of dirty, your hands get kind of dirty. And when you come home, and you walk into your clean kitchen, and you look at your hands, or maybe your wife looks at your hands and says, what happened to you? Or you're like, whoa, was I eating with these hands last night? You walk into the light, and you're suddenly aware of your, your filthiness. That's what growing in grace is. To grow in the grace of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is to remember that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and that the, 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 the payment of sin is death. I deserve to die because of my lovelessness, my disobedience to the Great Commission. I am a worthless servant. And so growing in that understanding and then at the same time in your appreciation for God's forgiveness. Tim Keller, I hope you listen to and love Tim Keller even now that he's gone off to heaven. He says, you are far more sinful than you could imagine and God loves you way more than you can imagine. That's growing in grace. But there's a second way that you can grow in grace and that's to grow in gratitude. As you grow in the understanding of what God has done to save you, you become more and more and more grateful. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 15 says, for it is all for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. See, that's where we're going. The glory be to the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ both now and forever. Through what? Through your grateful attitude and mine, no matter what, because of how great his forgiveness is. What's the opposite of living in gratitude, growing in gratitude? Would be what? Somebody say. How? What? Whining. Whining. Thank you. Right to the point. Complaining. So many of us think that now that I'm saved, my life is going to be a red carpet of roses right into heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's the opposite. It will be harder and harder and harder as your faith grows and God gives you the compliments of Abraham to whom he said, take your son, your only son on the mountain and sacrifice him in my name. And he obeyed. And God will ask you for that thing and you will say, it hurts, but thank you, Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey you because you have given me your grace, your forgiveness, and I can thank you in all circumstances, which is your will. Remember that story of my father's second plane crash? I don't know how many of you heard it when I told it here several months ago, but they had crashed in the jungle, the Amazon jungle. My dad was a missionary pilot. They're sitting on the floor of the jungle. Dad has two broken legs, seven broken ribs. His lung is punctured, and he's sitting in aviation fuel, which is burning his backside. And he says to the younger pilot who he's training, Gordon, pray for us. And they're all sitting there waiting to be rescued. And Gordon Oxnavad takes a deep breath and he says, God, thank you for this crash. And my dad says if he was well enough, he'd have picked up a log and thrown it at him. <laughs> but in the long run, the story of that crash is still bearing fruit today in the sermon in Calvary International Church in Sao Paulo. God was in control even in that horrible situation. Grow in gratitude for the Lord's love and for everything else under his sovereignty.
That's what it means to grow in grace. This week, our friend Elias Araujo, who used to sit right here at Calvary and has moved up to Natal, he sends me a little voice message encouraging me every week. He listens to our message. So, Elias, I hope you're listening. Uh, He sent me a, a, a message that said, please be loved by God. I thought, that's great. That's it. In every circumstance, I'm going to just be loved by God and be thankful that Jesus loves me and has saved me. There's a final way that I'd like you to be challenged to grow in grace, and that is through generosity. Hilarious generosity. Ridiculous generosity. Sacrificial, crazy generosity that only makes sense in view of the judgment and the new heaven and the new earth where Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Where did I get this from? 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. If you don't know this verse, write it down and meditate on it. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's what we're supposed to be growing in, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. To grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is to be ridiculously generous. And I would suggest even in your poverty, maybe especially in your poverty, because when Jesus saw the widow put one coin in, he said, she put more in than all the rich guys. So it's an advantage to be poor. Two heais. It was supposed to be for your lunch. And you put it in the offering and say, Lord, here, see this. Be crazy with generosity because the Lord was crazy with his generosity when he went from his throne down to the lowest place, humbled himself and became obedient to pay all that he had to buy you from from death and Satan and sin. As I was thinking about this growth, it seems to me that evangelicals see God's grace as the way in, right? Right? Grace paid for my sin. God's grace is what saves me. By, faith, by grace, through faith, I am saved. But then we sort of sit in church waiting for the second coming, and we don't grow in grace, grow in that understanding. And Colossians commands us, as you receive Christ, so walk in him. Every step is by grace through faith, and we are to grow in our appreciation of that faith so that life becomes a reason for praise and joy and gracious service to the king. It's kind of like transportation. How so? Do you remember in the movies, the old carriages, metal wheels pulled by a horse? It's like the ox carts in Brazil. You used to have to go from Minas Gerais to Sao Paulo in an ox cart, bumping over every rock all the way. You felt every single one. Why? No suspension directly on the, the wheel on the road. But then they came up with springs. So you have these carriages, you know, they're bouncing along. They go over the bumps and you sort of bounce along. <laughs> Somebody invented the shock absorber. It would slow down going up. So you sort of had this level, easy. Well, think today about some of these off-road vehicles that do jumps and go through ditches and can, can stay upright over any obstacle. I think that's what it means to grow in grace. How much does it take the devil to stop you from rejoicing and believing and being at peace in his presence? How much does he have to, does he have to just put a pebble in front of you and suddenly, oh, I don't know if Jesus loves me. Growing in grace means, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter, I've seen it before. I'm on my way home. I know the new earth is coming. It doesn't matter if I'm robbed. It doesn't matter if I'm sick. Jesus loves me and he's in control and I don't deserve anything that I've received because I'm more and more aware of my sin, of his forgiveness, of how he's using me in the world even by singing a song when I have nothing and no reason to sing it. The second thing we're supposed to grow in is the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I talked to the kids this morning about Revelation 3.20 What Jesus wants in that verse is to sup with us. That means have dinner. That means sit down at coffee and enjoy fellowship with us. And he's constantly knocking, asking to know us better. It's an infinite trip to know Jesus better and better and better. And we do that by responding to his call for fellowship. Do you know Jesus? 
I'm not saying know about him. Do you know him? Three verses. Revelation 3.20 is the last one. Paul's manifesto of his life purpose is in Philippians 3, 10, and 11. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of the resurrection. That's the gospel raising me from the death of sin. The Bible says I was dead in my sin and the power of his resurrection comes in and wakes me up, gives me spiritual life, opens my eyes and ears to him. So that's the power of introducing himself to Jesus or Jesus introducing himself. And then the participation in his sufferings. See, sufferings help me know Jesus because I'm suffering with him. Hopefully, if I'm not suffering the consequences of my sin, I know him through my sufferings. Becoming like him in his death, taking up my cross, denying myself and following him, and so somehow attaining to the res resurrection from the dead when we will see him as he is and we will be like him, John says. That's the ultimate knowing. Today we know through a small hole of faith, through the word and through the Holy Spirit. Galatians 4, 8 and 9, and I'll read verse 10 all the way through 10, uh, is a key. This is a key for how you grow in knowing Jesus. Listen to what it says. Formerly, when you did not know God, so there's a key. There's a time when, nobody, when you don't know God and you have to be introduced. You were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather, Paul says, that God knows you, that you are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. Wait a minute. Doesn't God know everybody? Does God know everybody? He knows about everybody. He knows all the details. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He knows every day of yours, past, present, and future. But he will say to some at the end, I never knew you. I never knew you. I kept knocking. You didn't open the door. I know about you, but we don't have a relationship. We're not friends. You didn't let me in. Knowing Jesus is the same as his knowing me, which means that I open more and more doors deep in my heart, letting him see all the secrets in the closets so that he knows me. And then in his reaction, I know him. In his sanctification, his conviction of my sin, his comfort in the Holy Spirit, I know him because he has come to know me. Then finally, Peter says, to him be the glory, both now and forever. Amen. Through this growing in grace, you and I glorify Jesus every day as we go through this valley of tears by faith. We can glorify Jesus with our songs of praise, with our thank you, Jesus, with a smile on our face, with a generous offering to someone who needs it, even in our need. Jesus gets the glory. And Peter's saying, and forever, meaning at the judgment, everybody's going to know. They're all going to know how good your friendship with Jesus is. So develop that now so that forevermore it will bring glory to Jesus because the work belongs to him. The more grace I receive, the more aware I become that all good gifts come down from the Father of lights. All love, all truth, all strength, all goodness and beauty originate in Him. You and I are just the prism, a stained glass window that He made so that His glory may be known. Listen to 1 John 4, 10 to 12. This is love, not that he, we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. People see the Lord through Calvary loving one another, bearing each other's burdens, as Brother Rick challenged us this morning. 
God will get the glory. Jesus will get the glory. Let's move toward interpretation as we finish. What does this mean for us? Number one, do you know you're his beloved? You know, when you say Jesus loves me to somebody and they say, eh, God is nice. All of us. Jesus loves all of us. They don't understand. They don't get it. Jesus loves me. Jesus died for me. If I was the only person that needed saving, he would have come and saved me because he loves Thomas Smoke. And he loves you. Know that you're his beloved and then become the beloved of his people. Remember the judgment and our hope of living forever in the new earth. This is what Peter's saying. Since you've been forewarned, since you know this is where we're going, live like it's true. Lay up treasure for yourself in heaven. Don't spend your whole life in thought around what will end up being burned. Stand guard against the error of the lawless that there are no consequences for disobeying the king. Why is it that most of us think we don't have to do anything about the Great Commission? Why is it that I don't think it's my job to reach the unreached? That's the missionary's job. No, it's not. It's the body of Christ's job, and everybody has a task in it. I don't think everybody's a missionary. Some people have that call. But every single person is called to pray to the Lord of the harvest. Every single person is called to give sacrificially to get them all the way there and then support them while they're there. Every single one of us is called to make disciples. And that those disciples would make other disciples and multiply like yeast in the lump to fill everything in every way with the glory of Christ. And then grow in grace, more and more aware of your unworthiness, giving thanks more and more constantly, and giving more and more generously, hilariously, even extending forgiveness because as he has forgiven us in Christ. Listening rather than talking. Serving rather than seeking to be served. Putting in more than you take out. And then number five, grow. Grow in relationship with Jesus as Lord and Savior. You begin to love what he loves. You want what he wants. You listen for his still, small voice in your heart and obey it. Tim Keller says there's a fountain of love at the heart of the universe. It's called the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They've been loving each other and glorifying each other for all eternity. When you die, if you're a believer in Jesus, or at the end of time when you're a believer in Jesus, you'll be plunged into that fountain, and all will be well. Believe the gospel and fear no darkness. How should we apply this? In September, I'm going to Pakistan, trying to grow my beard. I'm going there with Josue, actually. Josue is wanting to come with me. Somebody help him pay his ticket. He doesn't have the money to pay his ticket. We're planning a conference for the Pakistani church to reach 823, I think, people groups who have no chance of hearing unless somebody goes there and tells them. So the purpose of this conference is to say, hey, you guys have a treasure. You can reach the people in your country before Jesus comes back with the power of the gospel, the message of the gospel. We need help to do that. This is not a cheap venture. The church doesn't have the funds to bank this. And so we're promising to help them to rent the venue, to pay for food for four days, to bring people from all over the country to hear different, different messages of challenge and to then send them out to reach the ethnic groups in their own country that don't know the gospel yet. Would you give something to help us do that? I'm not asking for me. No, nothing of this is going to get taken out or used for anything else but this conference. And I just want to challenge you as Calvary to help Josue and I go to there in September and mobilize the people of God there to do that. There's a little girl that our friend there met on an evangelism, evangelism crusade. She, he was evangelizing and the father came up and said, you know, this little girl's not going to live with me next week because we can't pay our debts. And the landlord said we can give him our daughter in exchange for our debt. And 
my friend was just appalled. He said, what? You're going to pay your debts with your daughter? He said, what else do we do? We either get thrown out, or he said he'll take our nine-year-old in payment for our debt. And, he, and my friend says, how much? And it was like $63, U.S. dollars. And so my friend went to all of his teenage youth group, and the guys that were there with him doing the evangelism project and says, how much do you have in your pocket? And they put together an offering of $63, and they bought the life of a nine-year-old by paying her dad's debt with $63. That's growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, who, though he was rich, became poor so that through his poverty, he might make you rich so that you would do the same thing. My friends, let's grow as Calvary in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, touch every one of our hearts. Don't let us waste the time you've given us. If someone in the sound of my voice has not repented, Lord, have mercy. Grow your grace over them that they might fall on their knees before you before it's too late, repenting of their sin, opening the door of their heart once and for all and inviting you in for salvation. But I believe most of us have already done that once and we need to grow in our understanding of our sinfulness and your great, great forgiveness, in our thankfulness all the time and in our generosity to your great work to fill the world with the knowledge of your glory as the waters fill the sea. Do that work at Calvary. Make us a place of grace. Make us a place where people can come and see you because we obey you. We love each other and we love you. Do that through your abiding spirit, through the seeds of your word planted for so many years in this place so that you can get glory for yourself now and forevermore. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.